All right, I think we're live, uh, Damien. So, um, so my live name is Simon. Live here at SoundCon, day, yeah. day two, awesome. Yeah, so Simon Ashby, head of product, and I'm with... Damien Kaspauer here, yes, software sir. product manager at Audio Kinetic. We're glad to be here today with you. Yeah, certainly. And today we're gonna talk about approaching the 3D audio ideal. So we're not pretending we nailed it so far, but um, by adopting object-based rendering, we believe it's an extra tool in the, in the toolbox to approach this ideal of reproducing the world as we experience it as human being. So we have a lot of content for you today, and we've separated that content in four parts. And the first portion is basically trying to answer uh, what, why should I care as a sound designer, as a composer working there? So, and during that portion, we're going to talk about um, perceiving and encoding spatial audio. And then we'll transition to how will I use it? So it's basically the improvement we've made in the next version of WISE that will really soon to fully support object-based audio everywhere in the, in the pipeline. So Damien will cover that part. And then we'll get back to what should I know? So basically methods and techniques and tricks for sound designers and composers when you have to deal with object-based audio. And finally, the Q&A portion of it. So we've done a few run-throughs uh, already. We have for about 50 minutes of content. So there's a good 10 minutes for the Q&A at the end, and then we might move to the uh, Outspace VR uh, thing if there are still questions after that. So let's just start with the, the first portion. So perceiving and encoding spatial audio. And I'm gonna start with encoding spatial audio. And as um, like for more than a hundred years, we've been able to reproduce recordings and sound and for the longest time in mono. And mono is great, that's fantastic. And it, we had to wait up to the 70s basically to have a commercial mass adoption of stereo setup where we could finally start talking about spatialization and directionality of sound and things like that. And then with the ability of renting VHS and film and all that, so the industry kind of gathered around having this uh, theater experience at home. So came Dolby Pro Logic, for example, in the, in the 80s. And then we had proper 5.1, like full channel on all full dynamic range and, and frequency range on all speakers. Um, and then we had 7.1. So for the longest time, we are always on the same plane, basically, in actually in 2D. And more recently, uh, with Atmos, and a bit before that with Oro 3D, for example, uh, we now have hemisphere of sound. So in 714 setup, like, like we have today. And, but the reality is that there's a lot of people still playing on mono speakers with their Bluetooth device, uh, for example, or their smart speaker talking to Alexa or Google Nest or things like that. And, but the real champion these days is definitely the headphones. And, and it's interesting talking to you um, that author your music and sound most probably through speakers because we're professional. We spend the day working doing that. Maybe less now that we're all home working, <laughs> but typically it's there. But the reality, when we look, and if we look at the sales projections uh, for the next five years, the reality is that the user base, the players are mostly playing over headphones. And if you look at those numbers here for the next five years, you can see how earphones and headphones are the, the real champion for what people are purchasing and how we can assume they will listen to their content there. And just to get the red line at the bottom for loudspeakers and portable Bluetooth, I had to combine everything like, um, like satellite speakers, sound bars, in wall, outdoor, multimedia, like everything just to get those speakers arriving in the graph. And the smart speakers are, are more increasing basically and, and had some interest, but definitely headphones. So let's talk now about how we perceive spatial audio. And there are two main factor in, in perception of audio, one that can be reproduced by tools and technology, and the other one that has to do with ourselves, with our, us as human being, how we experience audio uh, in our life. So 
in terms of tools and direction and, and technology, what we can do is to encode the directionality of sound using ITD, IID, and HRTF, basically. And just a quick recap on those, I'm pretty sure most of you already heard and know everything about it. So ITD is the time difference for a sound to get from to one ear and the time difference to get to the, the other ear. And that difference is not even a millisecond. It's really fast, but that's enough for the brain to pick up directionality with that information. The other aspect is the IID, interaural intensity difference. And sometimes it's referred to as ILD, level difference, but same thing overall. And it's basically the, uh, the head shadow effects uh, that one ear will have its sounds um, change basically a different amplitude, different timber and phase uh, at various frequency, especially at high frequency. So, and you can see on those graphs just there that at low frequency, basically the head doesn't change anything. And that's explain why it's so difficult to locate low frequency sounds in space, um, where at high frequency, the brain has more information with the amplitude, timber and phase differences to pick up directionality. And finally, the infamous uh, HRTF, uh, which stands for Head Related Transfer Function. So those are sets of filters um, that tries to model the shape of your head, pinna, and torso. So basically the sound just before it gets to your eardrum and inner ear there. And that varies a lot from one person to another. So that also explains why some people will say, well, HRTF doesn't work at all for me. Others will say, well, it works fine. It's not fantastic, but it, it does work and it varies a lot. The holy grail of that is definitely the personalized HRTF. If you have the chance to get your own head and ears model, uh, then the spatialization becomes really great. It really feels like almost real life. So that's, that's really cool. So this is to encode directionality. Now there's another aspect to it that is quite important, which is the environmental effect. Basically the reverb, the early reflections, the sound propagation, diffraction, occlusion, like all those phenomena regrouped together will again, help the brain perceive where the sound should be located. How far from me uh, is it occluded? That kind of information. So this is what Tools like game engines and, and WISE, for example, can reproduce uh, using technology, basically. But there's this other set that relies on how we perceive sound as human being. So, and well, the first one, the rendering of source material, this is something during production that you have a certain control over. If you're recording actors and you ask them to shout versus whispering, that will provide a good cue about how far this uh, voice or this character uh, is in real life, right? Or, or in the game you're working on. And things like uh, preconception and learned behavior. If you hear a helicopter sound, well, it's most probably above your head, right? This is <laughs> what we've learned over time. Um, that's normal. And finally, visual fusion, where each time we hear a sound that we're not seeing, like we, we move our head, and we finally locate exactly where that sound is because our eyes are much more precise than our ears to perceive there. So the ears is kind of tipping you, there's something on the side, you turn and, and then you really locate where it is. And as we do that many times a day, all our life, we kind of get better at specializing uh, things over time. And by the way, the content of that slide, there's Brian Schmidt that has done a full hour presentation on that. I don't know if you're there, Brian, but if you are, shout out to your presentation. It's, it's a really great presentation about how we perceive sound. It goes into tools and technology, human experience, but also scientific research and all that. So if you're interested by the topic, I encourage you to list, to watch um, Brian's presentation. You can find it on our YouTube, Audio Kinetic uh, YouTube channel or directly on our website in the video section. Just look up for uh, Brian and you'll, you'll find it. Really good stuff there. So for the longest time we've been, and, and here I'm, I'm writing wise on the thing, but you know, since the Beatles, when they started <laughs> releasing their albums in stereo and, and later in the seventies, we've used channel based format in that at the time stereo to render directionality and environmental effect. 
So if we're doing a game, we're using WISE, this is what WISE has been doing forever. And with that information, with the final mix at the output of WISE, we send that to the endpoint, which is the receiving end, which is your, your system receiving WISE audio and applying it, apply maybe further transformation and then send it to the speakers or, or the headphones, for example. So, so that's fine in itself, but channel base has some problem though when you start panning content. So for example, um, let's say you have some stereo music license and you play it, but since you're in a game, you have access to the, the, the listener orientation and you can pan that content, for example. And because even if you're listening in a 7-1 environment, because the speaker angles are not regular, you end up having some stereo image distortion going on on your signal as you pan it. And just imagine if it was flying above your head, then it will kind of <laughs> take the entire space. Um, so that's not fantastic. And there's some volume dips as you go, some phase issue, that kind of thing. So a much better approach to preserve spatialization is actually not to do it in WISE. It's so you, you, you still do in WISE. And when I say WISE, like whatever middleware or your, your game engine, so you still print the environmental effect. And what you do is that you send all your 3D objects as audio objects to the endpoint, and you let the endpoint do the directionality encoding. And why we're doing that basically just because, so yeah, so we're sending objects plus their metadata to the endpoint because the endpoint has a much better understanding of how as, as the end user, you're listening to the thing. Are you over headphones? Can I apply personalized HRTF or semi-personalized HRTF to you or over speakers? And maybe you have a 4.0 system and the endpoint can know about it and do the proper, um, the proper directionality encoding for that setup. So that's the reason why it's worth delaying to later the encoding of directionality. And talking about, uh, objects and their metadata. So what is an audio object? And during that presentation, we refer a lot to it. So it's basically an audio buffer. So let's say 512 samples. It's an audio buffer accompanied by metadata, which is created, modified, or consumed by the WISE rendering pipeline prior to be sent to the endpoint. And an example for such metadata would be true 3D position, distance, azimuth elevation, spread, and so on. Where, and that you should not confuse with game objects, which is really this actor or this game entity uh, that will receive events uh, from, receive wise event basically, and send back to wise the position of the game object and their orientation, the states, the RTPC, and, and so on. So just, it's important to make that distinction between the two type of, of objects there. So that's a perfect segue for, uh, for you, Damien, to talk about uh, the improvement in WISE that we're doing there. And I'll stop sharing to let you present. Excellent. Thanks so much for the setup, Simon. Uh, it's exciting to be here at uh, the intersection of technology and human experience that you're talking about in this representation of spatial audio. And I wanna talk more about how we're tackling that evolution uh, in the next full version of WISE. And that starts with the audio device. And we're updating that for the next full version of WISE uh, and bringing it into the Project Explorer audio hierarchy. So for the first time, we'll display it right alongside the other hierarchies. And it's indicative of the flow that it is expressed in WISE as sounds pass through uh, the hierarchies into the master mixer, and then finally to the audio device. And this audio device is a cross-platform um, piece of the signal flow puzzle in WISE. For those of you that have used, it, used WISE before, uh, you haven't had a lot of access to that. And we've been building in the ability for you to uh, adjust the properties of this cross-platform audio device. So being able to specify the use 
of spatialization. Um, configuring the, the channel format for headphone or speaker based uh, mixes and, and enabling objects when they're available to be leveraged by the endpoint. Additionally, we're bringing in profiling. So for the first time, you'll be able to know the audio device that's been initialized at runtime in your game. And you can see what the configuration is set as uh, and help you understand a little bit better about uh, the sound that you're delivering. The, the two big pieces of that are three big pieces grouped into two sections uh, are the main mix and 3D objects piece. And these two pieces uh, on endpoints that support uh, objects and spatialization um, can be rendered over headphones and their either channel configuration or object composition can be binauralized or virtualized uh, for a headphone based listening experience. Additionally, the third channel that the audio device allows for is a pass through configuration, uh, which is untouched by any filtering or um, or spatialization present at the endpoint. So I want to take you through a authoring scenario for our virtual sound walk through the forest. And as we do that, I want you to pay attention to the color coding. The first thing uh, is we're going to have some ambient backgrounds as we take our virtual sound walk. Uh, second of all, we'll be using um, pink and for our objects uh, and the creatures that we'll encounter. And lastly, orange for the pass-through music for our adventure. And in every authoring experience, uh, we begin with silence in a nod to John Cage and, uh, and the re realization that there actually is no such thing as silence uh, in our world. But in these virtual scenarios, uh, it begins there, and as we move forward, we can imagine uh, the virtualization of a 7.1 channel-based format uh, pushing out the walls of this headphone-based experience. And in a 7.1.4, again, taking the, uh, the height elevation and removing the roof from the ceiling, while landing finally at this ambisonic representation of our forest background, which gives us a full spear representation of this forest that we'll begin taking our stroll through today. Uh, and how that looks in WISE is we have this spatialized bed uh, where sounds routed to this ambient background are gathered and delivered in a channel, channel for configuration to this main mix, which in our headphone based endpoint can be uh, processed with HRTF filtering uh, that is specific to a person when that functionality is available. And we can get the best possible spatial fidelity of this uh, environmental background for our forest walk. Uh, in WISE, what that looks like is we've created our ambient backgrounds audio bus. Uh, we've set our channel configuration to be same as main mix. And we've routed that through the master audio bus to be delivered to the system audio device and delivered to the endpoint at the end of the pipeline. The next stop on our virtual sound walk takes us uh, to music, something that I think we all like to accompany us on a forest walk from time to time. And in this case, we're talking about an unfiltered, non-diegetic or extra diegetic representation of music that is headlocked and full fidelity. And we want to carry that with us as we continue our journey through the forest. And this path, path through WISE uh, is delivered as a stereo, unfiltered uh, to the audio device, which then passes it to the endpoint in order to render it and maintain the full frequency, full fidelity of that music. In WISE, we would author that as an audio bus for our music pass-through. 
and set that channel configuration to same as pass through mix. Uh, now these two mixes all link back to those audio device properties and audio device settings that uh, we established uh, as part of that new functionality that we've exposed uh, as part of the audio device in WISE. And lastly, on our forest walk, it wouldn't be complete if there were not some happy animals following along and guiding our way as we wound through the forest. These objects and all of their positioning information uh, can be passed on to the audio device individually as unique sounds uh, with all of the rich metadata that Simon was talking about. And all of that gets handed off to the endpoint who again understands what the user's configuration is and knows best how to position those in the world for the best possible representation. And in WISE, it's as easy as adding an audio bus for our audio objects and setting the channel configuration to object base. This ensures that sounds that are delivered to this audio bus will be preserved as objects along with all of their metadata uh, and delivered to the audio device and then finally to the endpoint. And this is a full picture of the new audio pipeline for WISE 2021.1 and really encompasses these three pieces of what we see as a comprehensive tool set to help you author at the greatest level of detail for spatial precision. There's a couple other considerations that we want to take into account. Uh, as we're walking through the forest, uh, petting the capybara, uh, we may want to compress the sound of these object elements uh, and make sure that their dynamics are in control. And in WISE on our ambient audio objects bus, we can instantiate a compressor, which has now been updated to be able to gather all of those audio objects and evaluate them as a group. And without mixing them into a channel configuration, carry back the volume offset to each of those individual objects and continue flowing objects through the pipeline to the end. There's also this, the idea that maybe we wanna add reverb to this scenario, that our objects actually should be processed uh, and given some kind of environmental feeling. And so in this scenario, we've added an auxiliary bus for our reverb forest environment. We'll count on the game to establish that uh, now that we're uh, taking our sojourn. And we can author that in any channel configuration we choose. Uh, an ambisonic first order configuration will give us a, a four channel representation, again, that can be delivered to the endpoint and unfolded. We can also take that to fifth order, which gives us 36 channels of ambisonics uh, in a full spherical sound representation. Uh, and that gets routed right through that spatialized bed to the main mix and delivered to that endpoint. Alternately, maybe we don't want to spatialize uh, the reverb and we could send it through the pass-through in order to uh, bypass the filtering that happens as part of that main mix spatialization uh, on a, for an endpoint that is capable. The last look will give us a peek into how that is routed inside of WISE across the different hierarchies. Uh, first of all, we have our audio device, and that is uh, that the master audio bus flows into. Our objects coming from the actor mixer hierarchy and the ambient fauna um, work unit uh, flow through the ambient audio objects audio bus uh, to the audio device, and each of their individual metadata positioning and properties is maintained as it flows through to the endpoint. Uh, for our main mix, we have both the ambient background work unit uh, routed to the ambient backgrounds audio bus and, and the uh, game defined auxiliary send for our ambient fauna routed to our reverb forest auxiliary bus. Those are both directed to the main mix uh, and delivered to that endpoint to be 
virtualized in a ambisonics configuration uh, and, and processed using that filtering and HRTFs that Simon mentioned earlier. Lastly, we have this music pass-through, uh, and this is our, our accompaniment on our forest walk. It's our fully spatialized, unfiltered music representation uh, routed to the music pass-through audio bus, uh, flowing through the master audio bus and through the path pass-through mix to the endpoint and preserved in full fidelity. So here's a summary of the changes coming to 2021.1. Uh, our audio devices are getting updated with cross-platform support. Effects are being made aware of objects so that they can be evaluated as a group, processed individually, and their precious metadata can be maintained and preserved. And we're adding in a workflow to be able to author the unique metadata that will evolve over time as these techniques become more and more used. And no wise feature would be complete without object profiling. Uh, so audio object profiling will include audio bus status. So you may have seen some of these icons popping up. We want to give you a clear picture of the visual representation of your mixing hierarchy so that you can understand the processing status. And that comes with also some, uh, some windows into what the processing status is of a bus. Uh, we have a whole suite of audio object views as part of profiling that allow you to trace the flow of objects and its influences and really hone in on, uh, you know, a object or group of objects that uh, you need to know more about. And lastly, this audio object 3D view will give you a way to see your objects in relation to the listener uh, in a three-dimensional way and again, help to focus that profiling experience. And I think we're just, I, this fundamental shift uh, in resolution at, that can be authored for spatially enabled endpoints is so exciting. We're happy to be bringing this level of accessibility to the new pipeline. Great, great. Thanks, Damien. I'll continue sharing. Here we are, interesting discussion in the chat as you were talking about, talking about the animals you put in your slides and <laughs> the animal kingdom going on. People nice, okay. blown away by the idea of fifth order ambisonics being a thing and, and so on. So, uh, and other people awesome. saying, can't wait to, uh, to try it out. So uh, great, there's a, a lot of uh, positive feedback so far. Fantastic. So for this uh, third portion, we basically wanted to answer like, what should I know? So um, I've, I have experience with sound, with music, I have done games and so on in channel base, but will come soon my first project with object base. What should I know basically? So what, we, what we've done is interview um, six different studios, uh, actually. So I spent a, a good hour with uh, Christopher Larson, Victor Phoenix, Simon Gobbleton, Kristen Quinn, RG Mattingly, and Carly Knight, and Mr. Anonymous that wanted to remain anonymous. And why these persons exactly? Well, because they have a lot of experience with VR games. And it's been possible to author an object base in WISE for at least five years. Uh, so all the VR titles were using that, but using, uh, doing that through a mixer plugin and, and the workflow was kind of difficult and clunky. Um, so that's why we're kind of proud that we're heading toward this new version of WISE where there's a, a proper support for objects throughout the thing. So basically, I approached these people saying, well, in a few weeks, we're going to have this presentation at Game SanCon. There will be people there that will want to know like, okay, but what should I know? What should I consider for the next time I'm, I'm going to be authoring in that? So the, the following basically comes from these persons uh, mostly. So, um, so I had tons of questions for them, but mainly two, what, like what's different when authoring with objects compared to channel based and what principles and techniques can you share with, with us basically was there. So um, the most common element, first thing that everybody mentioned was 
like the audio has to be at the service of the game spillers. So like, and the, the right question to ask yourself is, what is the level of fidelity you need uh, with regards to spatialization? Is the title asking for that or not at all, for example? And that's the number one question, not only for object base or VR titles, it's like for anything artistic in life, I think you do the audio for that reason, but that was literally the first thing they answered me out of them. And I think and, we've seen that for, for VR, that that is definitely part of what they're asking for. And as we move forward, I think it's going to, to be more and more uh, a question of how can audio help to service the, the game's pillars in that way. Yeah. Um, and audio has been using object-based audio for decades. Like, like in WISE, you have so you have those audio objects, but the difference is that now we have the ability to leverage it since we can send those objects down to the endpoint and get the endpoint to do the final uh, directionality encoding on that, now we can get a much more precise uh, rendering of that instead of rendering to a low spatial resolution channel-based format like 7.1 or 7.14 and, and so on. So HRTF, of course, was mentioned uh, by everybody and it, they, they were all saying it does increase the spatial resolution, but it, it's often at the detriment of the sonic quality. And the kind of artifacts you get is your transient gets mushy, like it, it, you lose your impact. Um, the low end is filtered out, so it kind of feel tiny and, and not full as how you hottered it in, in your DAW. Uh, the filters are introducing coloration and even phase problem and come filtering at certain extremes sometimes. So, um, so it's not transparent. So out of that, I kind of extracted three reactions. So some would say, okay, but we just have to embrace it. And other will say, no way. I don't want HRTF to destroy <laughs> the craft and, and all, the, all the attention I've put to crafting those sounds. And uh, a lot were saying, well, let's go hybrid and let's take the best of both worlds uh, to do our, our experience. So people saying embraces would say, yeah, it does mess with your sound, but it's their function. Just accept it. It's, it remains the better tool you have in your toolbox to deliver uh, accuracy in the field. And and they do have improved a lot on Oculus and PS5, especially uh, recently. They, they have a much flatter response. So, so there's, there's so much R&D going on in, in HRTF that that thing is, is, is improving every year. And an interesting angle at it was, well, it's important to future-proof what we're doing. And knowing that personalized HRTF really sounds close to reality, to how we experience sound as human being. If you start delivering your content using objects and eventually we get a way to have a personalized HRTF processing that content, well, you're just, you're just there, you're closer to where we are. So it's, it's not viable yet, it's not a mass market feature yet, but it will be one day. Well, I hope it will be. <laughs> um, so some people will say, no, dodge it, don't touch it. And except for, again, in VR titles, for objects I can grab that emit sounds because you can move it around your head and so on. So they would accept the HRTF artifacts on those. But for the rest, uh, they would go with standard audio and standard panning. So the pros of it is better audio fidelity, but you kind of need to rely on other techniques to provide a sense of spatialization and, and space. And finally, people going with the hybrid approach would say, you just need to find the right balance between interactive fidelity and the aesthetic fidelity. And so basically just ask yourself, how much spatial resolution do I need for, not only for a, a title for a game, but for specific elements inside that title, how, how accurate should it be or not? And in any case, when you go hybrid, it's, it's a balancing act, basically. You try to find something that makes sense, that carries well uh, what you intend to do with it, and it involves a lot of trial and error. And I heard that at least five times per interview. <laughs> so, so just expect a lot of trial and errors when you're gonna start doing that. 
So during that time, they shared with me some techniques that they've developed and, and some of them were really cool. So I just put it up there for you. Um, so this first one here, so that was a title where you're controlling a mouse. So you're, you're in, the, in the world, you're quite high compared to a mouse, right? And you're in a fixed position uh, in the room. So you can move your head around, but you will teleport from a room to another. So there's no uh, translation, if you may. And just to give a sense of spatialization without using HRTF, what they've done is they created three layers of ambiences one at ear level and the others above and below you. They were quad ambiences, each of them, and they exported each of the quad ambience as mono sounds so that they could attach those to various game objects. So literally to 12 game objects. And then they used uh, RTPCs and, um, and to fine tune how basically sounds would crossfade as you look ahead below the sides and so on. So that was one technique to an hybrid approach to, uh, to the thing, not using HRTF. So this other technique was to use a um, single stereo sound and use standard panning with that stereo sound and assign it to the pass-through mix. So basically unaffected by HRTF. And, and the idea was to get the stereo sound when it's in front of you, it's the full stereo thing. And that was used for large sound or explosions, for example, that kind of thing. If you have an explosion, it's in front of you, it plays stereo, it's loud and clear. But as soon as you start panning, uh, to the left or the right, then it will collapse to a mono source and be spatialized uh, around you. So to accomplish that, what they've done is simply attaching the speaker panning 3D spatialization fader to an RTPC, and they would attach it, especially for large emitters, they would attach it to azimuth so that it's in front of you, it's stereo. If you move left, right, it will collapse to mono, but if you just look up or down, it would stay stereo if the object is still in front of you. And for standard size objects, then they would use the listener cone. And in that case, both the elevation and azimuth would be affected uh, by this stereo to mono uh, trick, basically that they developed for that. So a couple of variations with, uh, with that thing, but this time involving uh, multiple layers. So for for a sound, let's, let's use explosion again, just uh, for the sake <laughs> of having something concrete. So they would basically export two independent sound out of the explosion. One would contain the low frequency of the explosion sound, and that will be assigned to the pass-through mix. So it's, it's loud and clear, it's not affected by the HRTF, and yet you keep the high frequency content and you make it an object and that will spatialize wet. And when that explosion arrives, you kind of get a mix of the stereo loud explosion plus the debris and the high frequency content being spatialized. And that worked pretty well once you found the right settings and the right curves to, uh, to make it sound good in the game. So a variation of that would be to not only separate your layers based on frequency content, but also based on distance. And for example, they take a sound, they separate it in this case in four different layers, and some will be pass through, some will be objects, and they will also factor it in at which distance from the listener that object is and play with volume curves and, and so on. Again, just to get the best of both worlds, like impact, but also spatialization. Another variation is to separate the sound base on dry versus wet layer. So the dry portion of it uh, is, is one sound and then they export, they print the reverb in stereo on a different sound and they will assign it so that at close distance you have the full stereo reverb, but as this object will go away, it will collapse to a, a mono reverb basically. I'm quite curious to hear how it sounds and especially in isolation, but with everything playing, apparently they, they could figure out a way to uh, make it work using this approach as well. Talking about music. So I was asking, is there anything special about music there? And for those titles that they've worked on, they said most of the content, at least 90% plus of the content for the music was extra diegetic. 
basically pay, playing directly on the headphones uh, and it's subconscious, right? So for them, it was okay. The pass-through is just fine. It plays on your headphones, exactly like Damien in his uh, walk in the forest uh, example. But sometimes they were adding an element of spatialization to their music. And I had, and I extracted two examples that are quite cool. So this first one is, they, they had the music playing, was an orchestra playing, and it's passed through, it's fine. But it needed a way to draw attention to, to a certain place. And, and the example was a cavern, basically. And so what they've done, they've put a game object at the entry of the cavern, and they attached the woodwind section to that game object. So it's still the same score, right? It's still the same music playing, and every everything plays on your head except for the woodwind section that you're kind of drawn into looking at what's happening with the woodwind section kind of thing. And that was a way for them to be guided or to guide the player toward that, uh, that location. Another one, um, this one, they, they were near the end of the project and they were telling me that like everything was great. Like the mix was taking shape and sound effects were great, the dialogue and everything felt cool, but they had this listener fatigue element with the music. It was the thing like tiring. So they started, they realized that it was all attached to the head and they said, well, maybe we need to position the music, rotate it, do something about it. And what they experimented that ended up working and they kept it for the game uh, so first of all, they separated their quad music into two uh, stereo streams. So in front was the orchestra, the rear was the reverb. This is quite typical uh, to export that. But then the cool thing was they said, how about when the player is moving his head, will softly rotate, like not exactly following the head, just like by 10, maybe 15 degree, rotate that orchestra, just the front layer, not the rear just the front and but softly lagging behind the, your movement, basically. So I don't know with the video and the conference how well that will carry through, but look at the head and how the orchestra will follow softly lagging behind a bit. And it looks like this. Does it make sense, Damien? Is it? Uh... Yeah, and just that little bit of delay, again, it makes you feel like the music's not just this like static thing in place from the same, you know, world location, but it has a bit of that dynamics. And I, I can see how that could uh, lessen that fatigue, right? Yeah. And, and when they finally nailed it, because there was some coding involved to, to create that delay and so on, but it, apparently it was a haha -ha moment where they said, oh, finally, now the music is like with the rest of the experience fits in. So um, quite interesting, this one as well. Another question I asked was, you know, as sound designers and composer, you, you spend a lot of time in your doc creating the assets. So anything useful we need to know at that level. And well, not necessarily something useful in terms of productivity, but maybe just be aware that if the HRTF that you're gonna be using in the end uh, in your game doesn't have its VST or AAX equivalent to preview the effect of HRTF in your DA, you kind of, you're, you're stuck in a loop where you have to export your content, put that in your, in WISE, for example, put that in the game, listen to it, realize, oh, there's too much of this, not enough of that, and go back and forth. Well, when they had the chance to have a VST plugin for the HRTF, the iteration uh, would go much faster at the DAW level. Something else interesting as well, and the specific example was with wind sound, waterfall, you know, sounds with a lot of uh, white noise content. Um, that sound designer was saying, well, I just like reduce the number of white noise as much as possible. And instead I'm featuring things like rattles and tonal elements and, you know, features in the sounds that are not white noise. So it will still pan well uh, with the HRTF, but with less like filtering artifacts uh, as it moves uh, around. Oh, and something else. So Again, those are games in the last five years and at the beginning of VR. And, and by the way, when we're talking with the objects and whys and so on, 
this is something that soon all platforms will support. Uh, so the next gen platform and Windows already there. Uh, same thing on iOS, Android. I'm assuming soon will follow the thing. So it, it's going to be everywhere. But but it's true that it's mostly started with with VR. So, so in that reality of VR titles, you end up having much more memory than you have CPU available. And they had, most of them had to bake their reverb directly to the dialogue and the scripted events and explosion things and everything literally because they couldn't afford any runtime reverb. So, and what they were saying was, it's okay. Like you get used to balance your thing in the DAW before importing uh, to WISE in the game. But there's a gotcha there because the more pre-cooking using channel-based formats, of course, you're at the DAW level, um, the less future-proof you are. And for some of them, like it was sounding great, they released the experience, it was fine, but then the marketing department said, hey, we're gonna cover this new VR headset that has much more CPU. Or for one specific example, they said, oh, we're gonna do an LBE experience out of it, a location-based experience when there's speakers and tons of stuff and you're walking in a real room. And so, and in that case, it was running off a PC with tons of CPU and memory available and they were stuck with all their assets pre-baked with reverb. So they kind of had to redo a lot of content there. So just to be and this, careful. This reminds me of like early days of game audio where you would render your, your game ready media or compress it uh, as part of your tool chain, right? So you yeah. actually submit the, the 8K file to your game. And when you went to do the, uh, the remake, all you'd have was that lossy asset at, at hand. And uh, it's good to be moving forward with these ideas. Definitely. I asked about dynamic mixing. Uh, is there anything specific there? And one really interesting observation uh, was with side chaining. And there's something, especially in VR, uh, with the field of view. So side chaining, you know, you have loud sound and they will duck uh, other sounds basically. And and when it's when the objects are located in the same angle, the same direction. It, it feels natural, everything is fine. But there's some phenomena in, in VR where if the sound that gets ducked are far apart in your field of view, then it feels uncanny. And they had to kind of reduce the amount of side chaining they were doing for their VI titles. People that had like made it many times on, on TV for console games and PC games and so on. Uh, but there's something with VR that doesn't seem to match as well. So they still use it, but much less in terms of how they set it up. Um, another one was the uh, listener cone to emulate the cocktail party effect. Again, that's a pretty good technique for anything over speakers on a flat screen, and it works also uh, for VR title. And basically the principle is you define a certain angle, let's say in this case, 180 degree, starting at which you're going to start attenuating the sound that goes behind you. And one example, they were using uh, about three to four dB attenuation for a sound going in the back. And for another title, which was much more narrative content, they, instead they were using an EQ band and reduced just uh, a band of EQ uh, there. So that, this is fine. You get a lot of emitters around you and it helps the player focusing on what's in front of you. But it has, again, it has a gotcha in terms of later, especially if we get to personalize HRTF um, in the future, then you start add, uh, adding the processes. So there's this technique, but then there's gonna be the HRTF, which is job is to help the brain saying this object is in front of you or behind and kind of directing you toward what's important to listen to. So we'll see <laughs> how that goes and and finally, a uh, last question I, I asked was somebody with a lot of experience with uh, higher order ambisonics, like with up to fifth order ambisonics. And I said at this level of precision, when you compare side by side an object or that object instead being rendered as a fifth order ambisonic. And this person was saying it's very close. Actually, it's, it's difficult to really know which one it is. But when you get multiple sounds playing, there, it seems to be a bit more blurrier 
than when you play the same sounds as objects uh, on the other side. So if your sound is okay with a bit of diffusion in it, ambisonic is great and, and, and you go for it. Otherwise, for any point source emitter, for any moving emitters, you should favor object if you can. And again, the number of objects you can afford varies from one platform to another. So it's not like you can make a choice and it fits them all necessarily. You might have to adjust that on a per platform basis. And, and I specifically ask if I have, you know, spot emitters that you put like in your forest, for example, and you put your sounds there. Uh, I said, it's probably okay to go with ambisonic. And the answer was, no, it seems to be something just better if you use discrete objects for those as well. All right, so as a recap <laughs> here, um, so bottom line, whatever you choose, whatever you're gonna do is, should be at the service of the game, right? And there's no uh, dogma around it is just what the game needs or some portion of the game needs uh, for, for the experience and that's the most important. But then with especially with the new version of Y that will make it really easy you get three different type of, of perspective that you can provide to the world of sound perspective or localization perspective. There's this pass-through mix it plays inside the head. It's great for music. It's great for UI sound to tip people saying, hey, there's an action, you need to do something, that kind of thing. There's your diffuse bed um, using the, um, using the, the, the uh, hi, that's not the right slide. We changed that title. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, the, the spatialized bed being your main mix, uh, basically. And and finally, your objects plus metadata, which is your pinpoint accuracy that you're looking for, really good for moving objects and so on. So it's just a matter of balancing which tool you need for, for what the game needs, basically, in a, in a nutshell. That is a great nutshell, Simon. And ultimately, it's all about delivering the right audio for the player experience, uh, making sure that they have the best access to what you're trying to channel as an audio creator. And I'm just so thankful to all of our, um, yeah. all the folks who sh shared with you, uh, all the folks we've been speaking with as we've been creating uh, this new feature. Uh, it's great to have their ears and uh, great to be here today to share that experience and, and help carry this forward. I think we're all learning together. We'll, we'll be evolving this technology together. And uh, it's great to see some questions coming into the Q&A. Um, Do you want to go up? through the questions? Yeah. I think okay. it's our, we're, we're there in our presentation anyway. I, th I think we got a few <laughs> minutes before we have to run yeah. off to the uh, alt space. Uh, if you have some questions, put them over into the Q&A. Uh, we'll round up in alt space uh, after this. Um, and I'd also mention that at the Audio Kinetic booth today at four o'clock Pacific time, we'll also be uh, answering any questions about WISE current versions um, and running through some features with Bernard Rodrigue. Uh, please just, uh, you know, access us while we're here. So uh, I'm starting from the bottom. What do you think? Okay, let's go. Easy one first. Is WISE free to educators? <laughs> Is the one you were reading? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, yes, yes. It's um, like everything regarding education and, and sharing the knowledge and all that. I think as, as the, a core policy at Audio Kinetic is that should be free, basically. So if you want to teach wise, uh, just go on our website in the learn portion. And there's a there's a workflow there where you can subscribe your school and so on. There's a legal agreement to sign, but nothing heavy. It's just that we acknowledge that you're doing that thing. And then you're going to get access to a full wise license and the plugins and everything. And this thing will just you just need to renew it once a year. Uh, the only thing that people are paying for education is if you're taking a certification. So again, the content is free, but if you want to be recognized as a certified 101 or certified 201 um, user, then you have to pay to take the
the exam, basically. And you have to have 90% or more to pass this exam, and then you'll be recognized uh, there. But yes, it's free for, uh, for educators. And yep. You can also find information about the licensing. We do have a free version of WISE, uh, as well as tiered licensing options, depending on the scale and scope of your development. So mm -hmm. definitely head to audiokinetic.com. I think it can answer a lot of your questions there. Uh, Move on to the next one. How does this scale or have options for scenarios like um, platforms delivering to PS5 versus Nintendo Switch? Um, what do I need to do differently? And ultimately, um, WISE is a, a cross-platform middleware engine. We're able to break out things on a per platform basis and you can author specifically for uh, in addition to something like the the cross-platform system audio device which can um, which can handle multiple platforms yeah so exactly so i think there is both you as an author of the wise project you can deliberately set different settings per platform uh, because you you have a better, you know how those platforms limitation or strengths are, but there's definitely that thing that at runtime when WISE get initialized by the game engine, uh, it's informed by what is the configuration of the system? Is it playing in 5.1? Is it playing over headphones? That kind of thing. And that will initialize your, uh, your default uh, audio device with the right settings, for example, and then you, yeah, you can leverage that thing. Something that will be much easier, much more transparent with the next version uh, of WISE, like Damien was presenting. Exactly. Do you want to read the next one? Next question. Will you still need to use a game engine to deliver multi-object audio with 2020.1? So ultimately, you still need to resolve uh, the output of the audio device from WISE to something that's running. Uh, and what we, what we call a game engine is a multivaried uh, answer. But ultimately, you need some application that is running WISE, initializes the, the WISE audio engine, and then is able to um, you receive these um, spatialized main mix and objects in order to render them in that, in that format. Want to take the next one? We got two minutes. Um, there's one that is really long. I'm a okay. <laughs> you want to read it or, or, uh, or just in the sense of time, we go with the short one. Uh, Okay, I'll answer the short one while you read the long one. So uh, is the object position metadata an open standard thing in Oro, Atmos, PS5, et cetera? Um, I don't think so. There's the, uh, there's the ADM format, which is, um, which is a standard format to delivering uh, audio plus metadata, especially uh, in the broadcast world. And it's a format that now Pro Tools supports and Reaper supports at least. I haven't uh, checked for the other uh, popular DA out there, uh, but it's not the format that we use uh, for, for in, in WISE. And I don't think they use that in Unity nor in, in Unreal there. So it's basically that information is really inside of WISE. We get whatever information we can get from, from the game, plus what WISE can generate and, and in terms of metadata. And now even with plugins, with object plugins, when a sound goes through a bus with an object plugin, that plugin can now inject new metadata and have its own metadata there uh, that will be consumed later, maybe by another bus or maybe by the endpoint uh, later on. So we've made it open in this way. So if DTS or Dolby or whatever company or a game developer would, would say, well, we want to talk to the endpoint in a sp specific way, well, they can create their plugin, inject whatever metadata there, and the endpoint will be informed by, by this information. Awesome. I'm going to just jam on this big question. Uh, it's talking about 
Uh, spatial audio, it's talking about using WISE with uh, Unity or other game engines to achieve ge geometry awareness. And I would say head over to our YouTube channel, head over to our Twitch channel, and dive into the spatial audio hands-on series that we've done there that uh, walks you through how to do that with WISE. Uh, this is a feature that comes out of the box, um, this ability to do this. We provide the integration across Unity and Unreal. So dig deeper into that on your own time. We're going to jump over to Altspace, and we hope to catch you uh, there. We'll also be at the Audio Kinetic booth at 4 o'clock Pacific time. So that's like a, a half hour from now. We'll be uh, there. You can get there through the Whova app. Uh, and then we'll be talking more about this uh, leading up to the, the full release. And we look forward to bringing you along for that, uh, for that journey. Great. Thank you very much, Damien. Thanks for everybody Thanks, attending. And, uh, and this video should be available on our YouTube channel later as well. So Brian gave us the okay uh, for that. So I've seen some people asking about the PowerPoint. Well, the video will be available uh, soon. I hope. Great. Which alt space room? We don't know. Oh, we'll that's see a good you there. question. Well, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, well, it's this room is the second one. It's GameSoundCon 2. Do you think there's the equivalent in alt space? This is a fantasy that I want to be a reality. So, is Brian on the call uh, with us? Maybe there he is. Let's us. say room D, he says. So, all right. We'll see you in D for Damien, and uh, we'll be right there. Thanks. Great. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great con.